Hi, my name is Stephanie Mintz, and I am the Strategic Relationship Consultant. I am so excited to share with Pearl today. Hello, sunshine. Good to see you again. Had to walk out to let you back in. Stuck in a storm of a relationship. Lost my fire. I am so excited to have you back for another episode of Conversations with Pearl. And I am, you know, we love talking about self-care and about relationships and about everything we can do to bring things that are better to our life. And today is no different because today my guest is known internationally as a strategic relationship consultant, Stephanie Mintz. She is M-A-L-M-F-T, provides individuals and couples with actionable strategies to reach their relationship goals. Stephanie is highly sought after for her ability to help individuals and couples at all stages of relationships from dating, living together, pre-engagement, premarital, just married, marriage, strengthening our difficulties, brink of divorce, and post-divorce, understanding why behind their challenges, and create individualized strategies that provide in-the-moment relief, immediate results that help them better navigate the journey of meeting someone to couplehood. From trying to meet someone who is the best match to lowering the temperature of heated arguments to improving or restoring connection, respect, calm, and laughter to improving communication and intimacy, Stephanie has helped countless couples learn to enjoy each other again and remember and reignite the spark that brought them together. After graduating from Emory University and earning her master's degree in clinical psychology at Anatop University, Stephanie embarks on a decade-long career as a notable licensed marriage and family therapist. As she grew her private practice, she recognized that her clients wanted more than the opportunity to discuss their feelings and could benefit from more active steps towards change. So using her years of experience helping individuals and couples, Stephanie began developing unique strategies to complement the in-depth counseling she was providing. Based on their successes, she separated these techniques from her therapy practice and formally began working as a strategic relationship consultant with clients around the world through her business, Strategic Relationship Consulting. Welcome to the show, Stephanie. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate it. That actually, um, I know that was a lot, but it gives um, a lot of how I actually got here. Um, And so it's a little bit about what I do and why it's so different. So I appreciate you sharing that. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. And talking about how, where you got here and how you got here. Let's delve right into that, right? So let's just start. (laughs) So so what, like where it was a point in your life when you said, this was kind of where I wanted to go. And then, and then how did all, we read, you know, everything in the bio, we shared all the information, but what brought you to where you would start at to where you are today? And why do you do what you do? So, you know, what was really amazing is uh, I was thinking about this question and honestly, it was a few days ago. I had never thought of this since I was probably a teenager. So coming here onto your podcast actually popped up this memory for me that was so incredible. So when I was younger, I um, used to go to a lot of movies. And I'm from L.A., thought I wanted to be an actress. I thought, you know, what a wonderful thing to contribute to the fun in somebody's life. Movies can be fun. They can be journeys. They can be a lot. But it was the happy part of people's lives. And so that was one area I thought that was so great. Then the other area was relationships. And I thought that would be really great. I thought maybe matchmaking or something like that would be because people... It's such a wonderful part of people's lives or can be. I have not thought about that memory since a few days ago. And I am, that was decades ago. I had no idea this is where I was going to end up. Uh, when the the acting didn't work out, that was it. I never thought twice about that, um, that thought. 
Um, I've tried a lot of different things. I'm actually one of those people, a big advocate of if you have an opportunity and you're able to find something you love, it doesn't matter what age you are. Again, if you're, if you're able to do that, this was a much later in life career decision to go back to school to become a therapist. I never thought I was going to do that. Wasn't particularly a fan of therapy when I was growing up, but I decided to make my way and find the way that would work for me in providing therapy. Almost gave that up along the way as well. Um, my brain thinks very differently than traditional therapy, which is how I ended up um, finding my path to not doing the therapy anymore, but really doing this, creating this new business. So I found, especially as I was working with couples, but individuals too, that the therapy, which is wonderful, I have nothing against it, but the type of help therapy provides can take a while. And when people are wanting help with their relationships, they're in what I call relationship pain. Their relationship is creating pain in their life and they want relief. They need relief. And our relationships are in our day-to-day -day lives. It comes up all the time. And so to feel pain throughout those days that with therapy, you meet once a week, you live your life, you're kind of, and you have to do the process. It's really about processing and that can take a while. So you're still sitting in this, what I call muck for a while. So I decided to try something different with my therapy clients. And I asked them a lot of content questions and um, I, sorry, I realize this is more about what I do, but it was the path of where it took me that um, one, I didn't know I was going to work on with relationships and couples. Again, that thought had gone out of my head as soon as it popped in. And I thought I was going to help people in other um, more traditional areas with therapy. But my first couple I worked with, I fell in love with the process, the energy in the room. It was I could see that there was a possibility for quicker changes. Um, I'm very much a solution oriented person in general. Um, and so I could the back and forth and the three people or so kind of trying to figure this out and engaging. It just felt different. And very quickly, when I got licensed, I got to be known for working with couples. People found me and all of a sudden, this was my life. This was helping people with their relationships. And it was absolutely what I thought of when I was a teenager, just had to get there over time. And then within it, I discovered that there was this other type of help that, that people were wanting, quick results, but more action oriented. I found that when I asked content questions, very detailed, what time of day was the conversation? Who initiated it? What was the exact word they used? Which in therapy, those questions are not asked and people, therapists tr will traditionally keep you away from that. And I understand, but my, I'm like a detective. I loved puzzles growing up. And so I look at this as a puzzle in a, a emotional puzzle. And I can pull out the pertinent nuggets of information and put them together. And I'm able to discover what went wrong, why and when. And then I can create a strategy that when this scenario or something similar, if they do this and this instead of these other, it will create a different result. And I started offering it and there were quick changes. I had couples who were saying they had the best week that they had in months or even years. So. I fell in love with the process. I found there was more people wanting this type of help. And so what I've done is I've opened up the area for relationships of what kind of help they can get. So now you have options, something with quicker results, something that's more um, uh, uh, action-based or more of the deeper work. And it just depends on what resonates with the people of what they're feeling most helpful. I, I love that. And a couple of things that stand out to me is like, so going back to when you started your business, what brought you is like, you know, we, we think we're going to go one way <laughs> and then we kind of pivot another way. And then all of a sudden it sort of comes back in a different circular way to us. And it's maybe not be exactly how we thought, but, you know, it, I, I feel like, like God has a funny way of doing that to us. Right. Like, it's like, I have oh, yeah. right here. You're just not paying attention to me. Stop and listen to me, you know? And, and so we kind of go this way and then we kind of circle back. And, but what I think is really beautiful about it, every time I hear these kind of stories is like, 
then you come back and you really are focused on what the message is you want to do, right? You're listening more. You're getting more clarification about, okay, this is what my my audience is wanting to hear. This is what it's I can bring to the table and help them, right? And then also what I, some of the things I said too is what I like as well is like, as a consultant, you, you listened to what the need was, right? Oftentimes yes. I've had clients come to me and they're like, I'm like, well, why do you want me to coach with you, right? And they'll be like, oh, because I had, because I'm like, you've had a coach before, so why me, right? And I want to know, why me? I'm like, well, yeah. because, because she or he did this and this, and they said they lived their life this way, but when I see them out and about, or see them on social media, it's not that case. And I'm like, well, good, I'm glad you fired them because you're going to get the real me. I'm going to, you're going to see me show up on social media telling you about, it sucks that my son died last year. You're going to see me talking about how I'm so oh. strong. You know, you're going to see me talk about how in my relationship, how I, my husband and I have almost 40 years, how we discuss things in our relationship. You know, you're going to see that from me. I'm not going to tell you my life is perfect, right? And I think that's so important is that when we can be, we can listen and they're like, oh, I get it. I want to be with you because you get life, right? It's like, yeah. So, you know, and I think that's so cool that, you know, you've recognized that and you've changed what you're doing oh, yeah. to what you knew you could bring to the table for somebody and for couples and, and help them. I, mean, I think it's such a cool story that they come back to you and say, and that, that's the best reward that we have, right? As consultants. Oh my goodness. Wow. I did that. And this is what happened. I mean, I just, I, that just always warms my heart when you hear those stories, you know? And so to have to address those things and also the thinking outside the box, because I think sometimes they want, you know, people say you should do this, 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 and this. I'm like, Okay, it's like, you know, like, like people sometimes, you know, compare therapists to coaching, right? And in my world, right? They're like, and I'm like, well, oh, yeah. yeah, you need there. And I'm like, I have a therapist. I'm like, I have a therapist. I go see a therapist, right? And I'm like, and sometimes your therapist is going to help you go to the past. I want to yes. help you go to the future. So how, let's yes. listen together and let's talk about it, right? So I love yes. that you, that you are, you, you kind of looked and said, what are the people that I work with really need, right? And said, how can I act on that? How can I bring that, you know, to to fruition for them? And and that's what you're doing. I think it's a, a beautiful, a beautiful thing. So I want to ask you, you know, yes. so with this, you know, this is just a conversation. So wherever we go. Yeah. We yeah. So what would you say? So I'm kind of thinking like, so one of the things that I did during COVID, I saw a need where, the women that in my community online that was that were following me and or I followed, I saw a need where they were like overstressed because they're trying to be moms, teachers, working oh, yeah. full time job. Like that, they're being pulled in all these directions, and they literally were complaining they had no time for themselves. Right. So I started this self care thirty day challenge, and it's grown now. It's become my Shira Lee. We meet every Sunday evening from eight to nine p.m. Eastern time. It's not recorded, but it is on Zoom, and it's just support. It's let's work on our goals. It's what do you need help in? You know, and it's just grown to this because I saw a need. Now, one of the things I know that I also heard through my group and then also my husband at the time, he worked for, he's retired now, but he worked for the department of VA and he was seeing the stress of his employees being like, okay, I've got to work these hours, but she's got to work these hours. You know, that, that whole balance. Right. And I okay. saw through watching with him and through my group, how it was re affecting relationships, like how that affects okay. relationships. You know, I did refer some people out to people like yourself, go, you know. And so what would you say that you've seen coming out of COVID was like, what was one of the biggest things you saw co before COVID? How was it before COVID compared to COVID? And then what are you seeing after as we're coming this post COVID? So it was an interesting thing. It's a great question. Um, People were more disconnected than ever during COVID. And if you think about it, it, it kind of feels or on the surface seems backwards. People were spending more time than, I mean, if you think back to cavemen, okay, the, 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 the husbands, the men went out and they, um, they were the, um, hunters and gatherers, right? And the women were at home and, and they were, um, taking care of the kids and, and the home, you know, and the huts and the thing. And they were not together all day. Nobody, men and women were never together all day, 24 seven. This was probably the first time in history this has ever happened for years. This is what it was. And so you would think, wow, they would be the most connected ever because they're spending this time 
And then ironically, it seemed like people were like, I don't understand. I feel lonely. I feel the most connect disconnected. I'm not happy in my relationship or my marriage. And so it was like confusing, but there was a key piece as to what was happening. So everything you said on top of what happened then later. So, I mean, being at home and with the kids at home, I mean, usually if the children are at school, there is that separation away and there's a focus on work or there's a focus on home and the kids come home, but you've gotten stuff done. This was everything at the same time. The kids on Zoom, the work, the laundry, everything, food needing to be figured out. So by the time the day was over, now also the fear, the worry, the stress, the, the, the loneliness, the health, everything. By the time people were done at the end of the evening, what were most people doing? They were going, oh. they were sitting on the couch, they throw themselves in the, and they were like, what are we going to eat? What are we going to watch? And that was it. And they get food and maybe even throw on a movie and watch it. Or as soon as they finished eating, they were. So what was happening is they were spending more time together, but they were not connecting. It was not quality time. So when I work with couples, I talk about um, different categories of time in a relationship or marriage, and they are all really important. And there's about five to six, depending on people's lives. So the first is going to be usually it's taken up with work. It's usually the largest piece. Then there is what I what I um, what I call uh, time together. Time together is when you're in the same room or the same home, and you're um, maybe one person's watching TV and one person's on their computer. You're not focused on each other. Excuse me, but what you can do is you can be like, "Hey, look at what I just read," or "Come take a look at this." So at moments you can talk, but you're yell, you're none of it connecting. Then there's quality time. Quality time is where you are just focused on each other and typically not with screens. Um, maybe it's a movie. Um, people watch TV and movie differently than they used to now, but it's still not fully quality time. But it is. It's nobody else and no distractions. Then there is um, what I call it's going to be um, time uh, with family or with friends, somebody else with you. So it's not just the two of you. Then there's what I call sort of the cool down time. And that's if there has been an argument and there needs to be a little bit of time to take a breath and, and regroup. We hope to minimize that. And I have strategies. And the last one is individual time. And individual time can be anything. Individual time means individual from your partner. So you can be with friends on your own. You could take a nap. You could take a class. It's just not together. And all of those are really significant and they give you something very different. But all together, it creates the life with somebody else. And people weren't getting the quality time and they weren't really getting the individual time either. I love that you broke that down for us. And you're right. They weren't getting that quality and that individual time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was, just, yeah. I remember my, my brother, I love my brother and my sister-in-law to death. And they have my nephew who I think is almost 10. I don't remember nine or 10, but when that all happened, my sister-in-law had had a, um, a health incident happen where she has mm-hmm. basically, she lives 50 first dates the rest of her life. So she'd fallen. So just before COVID this all happened. And so here he was, you know, kindergartening, helping my sister-in-law trying to figure out that whole process. And then, you know, the parameters of the rest, because, and he's in California. So they had such restrictions on, you know, getting that's where I am. Yeah. Yeah. So all of that, you know, trying to manage all that. And I'm like, you know, and then on top of that, my mom, you know, she lives in Southern California, but so all not too far from him. So, you know, he was trying to manage all that. I was like, brother, you need to like breathe, you know, you need to have that breath. And So, and then COVID hit, right? So then you're talking about all of this and you add that on top of, I just, you know, and I know he's an example, but I'm sure there's many other examples like that, that, you know, somebody's in the hospital, I can't go see this person in the nursing home, you know, all those, those things. And you add that on there, all that stress that we've come through. And I love to talk about the quality time without, you know, that I love how you broke it down that, that, that together time when you're in a room together. So uh, both of our boys are are grown. I mean, my oldest is, um, is forever 25 now. And my youngest one is 23. So 
you know, my my youngest one, my oldest before he passed last year, he was doing it on his own. So it was he'd come home, you know, but he's in the process of living with his girlfriend. So he'd come in or out the house. But pretty much we've been empty nesters for probably, you know, on and off for the past like four years. And so having that, you know, that I've been with Chuck so almost 40 years as, as next year. Nice. So having that, like, oh, we're by ourselves again. Like, there's nobody here to bother us, you know, interrupt us, you know. And finding that quality time and that uh, there's many times we're together in the room, but not, you know, and, and you describe like, hey, look at this article, you know, or we're sitting next to each other. Hey, look at this right here. Look what I found, you know, that kind of thing. So I love that you broke that down for us. And, and you know, and work, because a lot of times, I remember the days when I used to do mortgages and I would work so many hours and I would come home and like you described, like so exhausted, so, so tired. And so we came to a, a thing for both of us that we give each other that individual time because we know we need that, right? It's so, so important. And, and you know, for a long time, I would have that guilt about going, I'm going to do something for myself. I'm a, I'm a recovering people pleaser addict, I like to call it. And so once I realized I had to put my cape on first and take care of me first, I could show up better in my relationship with my husband and with my kids. But funny thing is the individual time, I'm always on him. You don't go do anything for yourself. You know, you don't go and, you know, but he just doesn't want to, but that's, you know, that's who he is. But one of the things that we've developed in our relationship, because you were talking about the time, the um, I'm finding it where you called it the, like when you have a little argument, like the argument. But oh, that, yes. Um, that, the cool down time. The cool down time. Yes. Thank you. Uh, that cool down time. I have it right here. Number five. The cool down time. We've created this this tactic that we do. So if one of us comes home and yeah. we feel like there's something on our mind we have to discuss, right? We'll say, are you open to receiving? So we're saying, I'm coming home or I'm coming to you and say, I want to discuss something. I don't know how your day's been. I don't know what headspace you're in. So I don't want to come in and talk about something that maybe you are that that even though you're not upset with me, but whatever's happened might re- make you react differently than I want you to react. So we give it each other the grace to be able to say no. That's not. However, the caveat is in 24 hours, you have to put yourself in the headspace to have the conversation. So nice. therefore, we're hearing each other and we're not letting it go on and on because. Good. And I tell him he, he, he jokingly said one time he goes where did we come up with that idea? I go, well, it's your fault. Because when I met him at 19 years old, and I turned 20 shortly after, I grew up in a household where if my parents had an argument, there was zero conversation about what was on their mind. They said zero to each other. You walked around the house like you're on eggshells. And then all of a sudden you come home uh-huh. from school and everybody's fine. And you're like going, what happened? When did they talk? You're like, you, that's, that's what I grew up in. So when I met Chuck and we moved in shortly after we moved in together, which my Catholic mother was really freaked out over. But when we moved in together, he, if he, if I, something he did bother me or I had something that upset me, I wouldn't say anything because that's all I knew was to not say anything. And he, he would go, I can't help you if you are not responding. Let me know what's on your mind. And so he got so smart. I just, I love my husband to death. He started having my arc, my side of the argument for me. He would be like, He'd have a conversation Cute. and he would answer for me. And I was like going, wait a minute, that's not how I would have responded to you. And he goes, well, you can say something now. So he'll tell wow. you, I should have never done that because now she doesn't shut up. But but I told him, I said, that's where that came from. Because I came to a point where like, okay, I have a voice, but I also know his Italian side can be a very you know quick to respond. And so I want to give him the space. And at the same time, yes. I know that I want space because if I've had a long day or something's yes. happened, I don't want to come home or have a conversation, you know, around something. So that's where we came up with that at. And, and it's been, it's been a great tool for us. That's worked amazingly well, you know, almost awesome. Like, yeah. So, so let's talk about that part, like communication, how when a client comes to work with you and that's like a challenge that, cause I, I imagine that's probably a big part of the issues could be part. I don't know if it's a hundred percent, but I'm sure it's a large part of communication. Oh, yeah. yeah. So tell us like, When somebody comes to work with you, Stephanie, like what can they expect and what, how do you help them around the communication piece? So everybody's heard communication is key. It's kind of like a saying people have heard. I actually believe it's way more than that. Communication is the pillar of a relationship. Without it being as strong as it can be, it is going to affect 
almost all the different areas in a relationship. So when people come, a lot of people know there's communication difficulties. Almost everybody will mention that as one of the things that they want to work on. And then they'll mention others. But ultimately, the others have to do and start with the communication. So with almost everybody, the communication can be strengthened and it is an area that we work that I work on. And it's one of the first areas I usually start with because it helps us then talk about the other areas. So the truth of the matter is it's what you described. We are never taught how to communicate. It's really unfortunate. I really do feel it needs to be taught in schools, starting in elementary school. There are a lot of things I learned, had to learn that I don't use, and it should be an absolute. Because if you think about it, every single relationship, every single interaction you have with somebody throughout the day is communication. Even if you don't say anything, if you're walking down the street and you pass by somebody and you don't say anything, you've communicated something. They may not know what you were actually communicating, but you did. You might you might not have said something because you were busy, because you were distracted, because you were stressed, but they may receive it as, oh, they didn't even care to like give me a nod. They couldn't even look at me in the eye. How rude. So everything is communication. So because we're not taught, we tend to absorb it by the influential people in um, adults in our life as we're growing up, for good or for bad. So as you mentioned, you came from a house where everything was really kept inside. It was pretended at some point everything was fine. You said people walked on eggshells, so it was very clear there were emotions. So how would you know how to express anything? All you know is to keep it in. And even though you knew it might not be good because it didn't feel good, if you weren't taught another option, how would you know what to do? So you revert back to what you know. So if somebody comes from a household that's yelling all the time, and as a child, they may go, I'm never going to yell as an adult. Never, because that's awful. But if they're not taught how to express anger in another way, that's all they know. So what I start with oftentimes is explaining it's nobody's fault but we're just going to strengthen this what i found is that people don't always realize the extent of what communication is how much in their day-to-day lives get affected and it is very very specific i talk about the language and the vocabulary we use it can make a huge difference. Uh, You can use a steak knife in terms of language, or you can use a butter knife and you can get the same thing accomplished, but you're gonna have a different response and reaction. So we have to be careful. So I talk about a big one is how and when we share information, okay? If you share it in the best way possible, use great language, but at the wrong time, like what you said with your husband, if you walked in the door and just said, hey, you know, when you did this, I didn't like this. And he was not in that space. He could, he didn't even hear what you said. He's hearing you're telling him he did something wrong and he's just going to shut it out one way or another. If you say it at the right time, but you use the wrong ways or not the best ways to say it, somebody's going to shut down as well. So I have a strategy that specifically is about how and when. Um, We also tend to not take what people say at face value, especially if you've been with somebody for a while. The amount of assumptions that happen in a relationship are all over the place. And especially if there's been problems with communication or arguments or things, we need to take all assumptions out. You need to start over and ask questions. You need to be sure. You don't want to say, well, I did this because I thought you were going to say this or respond this way. You ask. So it is way better to over communicate versus under. The problem is I often find it's under communicating than it is over communicating. But we also, and I have a strategy for this because this gets really tricky, is if I ask you, is something wrong, right? So if you come home, from, you know, um, from being out and you see something with your husband, that's a cue. Usually it means something's wrong or that you've learned and you go, hey, is, is something wrong? No, I'm fine. Are you sure? It seems like you seems like you're a little off. No, I'm fine. Come on. You can tell me what's wrong. You know, what 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 is it? No, I'm fine. Now you're going to create something wrong. But we tend not to believe, especially when we think we know somebody's cues. 
And now it can be very frustrating to ask somebody a question and feel like you have to ask them four times before you get an answer. And for the other person, it's annoying to hear the question. How about this one? This one comes up all the time. Um, what do you think? Would you like some pizza for dinner? Sure, that sounds good. Are you sure you want pizza? Because if you want something else, I'm happy to get... No, pizza sounds fine. You mentioned Mexican. We can do Mexican. Do you want Mexican? No, pizza is fine. So it creates extra. This is extra communication. And this actually goes towards honesty and trust. People also don't realize the extent of what honesty is. People think that when there's a break of trust or there's there's honesty, they think of the really big ones. They think if there's been infidelity, whether it's um, a, an affair, an emotional affair, whether it's financial infidelity, we tend to think of honesty and trust as the biggies. But what I just talked about in those examples have to do with trust and honesty. We have to be able to trust that whatever the per person tells us once, we have to trust that they're being honest. And then we also have to then take it at what I call, I say, face value. So I have a strategy to, to help people with this because we often need to reset and have a fresh start in the way that we engage with somebody so that we can set up new ways of being. And it actually makes it easier. It's such a relief. It's interesting because some of the strategies that I give, I can tell when I share them with my clients, I can tell they're like, oh, this is this is not a big deal. This doesn't pertain to us and everything. And I can tell and I'm OK with it. I know. And I also know the patterns and I'm like, no problem. So by the by the time that they're good and they go off on their own because they don't need me anymore and I check in with them, the amount of times those strategies are the ones that they say have stuck with them is so frequent. It's really interesting. And so really what I'm doing is giving people new ways of interacting, communicating. And when our communication is strengthened, it strengthens the connection because the more you feel confident in what the person's saying and, and confident that they're going to hear you, that they're getting their needs met and you're getting the needs met, the more connected you feel, the more you enjoy being with the person because now you're not arguing, it's calm. We need calm and peace and loving in our relationships. And then that actually increases intimacy, all different types of intimacy. I actually talk about three types, not just two. And it all goes together, but it actually starts with this communication. And when you have something actionable, you can focus on and say, when this happens this week, this is what we're going to do. And you're like, I know steps. It's amazing because you can see those changes. I had a um, client say with me, they said to me first, because they'd been in therapy, their first meeting, they're like, wow, you you talk a lot. You were, you were doing a lot of the talking. And I'm like, they're like, I like that. And by the end, they were super excited. They saw all of it. And they said, you know what? It's like you gave us a relationship operational manual. I went, that's a great way to explain it. And so it is receiving a lot of that. And my strategies look one way, but it's amazing how many different um, aspects in a relationship they apply to. Um, it's quick. I've taken people, I had a couple, I have several couples that went from um, bring a divorce, there was infidelity, to um, in 12 meetings, about three and a half months. This isn't always the case, but it happens. They had a marriage better than it had ever been, even prior to it. So when there is, and I was told it actually was because of the strategies, because things they could implement, we can make huge changes um, and get the relationships we want. I, I love, I, yeah, I agree. That's a beautiful story too. That be, yeah, to, and who would think, you know, with, with infidelity, how that, you know, because you hear so many stories about they don't work out, they don't, re, you know, recover from it. Um, my parents divorced after 43 years of marriage because of my dad's infidelity. That my, you know, God bless my mom for staying with him the way she did. Although I laugh and say, mom, the way you guys met, that should have been your first sign, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's another story. But I, as you were sitting here saying these things, like when you get the description about the dinner, like coming home and go, well, you might, you sure you want Mexican? Cause I know you want Mexican. I, I say, I'm like, I'm so proud of my husband and I, because we get, we've nice. got to the point now where, we say, hey, is tonight's the uh, the time 
food. You know, it's like I'm a type of where you think, yeah, okay, you know. If it's no, it's like right. okay, we we would just say, all right, and then one of us will go, well, I'm ordering it anyway. So, okay, no problem. You know, it's like all good. You know, and and I give that. I mean, I give so much of that to my husband because he he's such a great listener and he's nice. so insightful. Like like I watch my boys have amazing conversations with them, and there's actually a young man that we're mentoring um, right now that Chuck meets with them. And he's the same thing. He's like, he has he, he t- said to me, your husband's got such great conversation. I'm like, I know, I know. It's amazing. But sometimes it's like, stop being so insightful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I actually hear that too. I'm not trying to puff up, but sometimes it's, it's got, it's got, I'm like, I can't, I can't turn it off. Yeah. It's just, and it's truly just trying to be helpful. Yeah. Um, and that's, but yeah, sometimes it's yeah. just like, stop helping and, yeah and it's a beautiful thing and he has to get me to stop sometimes to be like especially when the kids were younger don't helicopter we he got in center control they're talking to me I'm like okay this is how i grew up you know again back to the patterns right but i like yep. you know, especially when you talk about the assumptions because we do we assume how somebody's feeling and i you know i've seen that and that's something when i you know when i work with my clients i'm like i'm not going to assume how you're feeling share with me what your thoughts are around that right and so I think it's, you know, that way, that example you gave, it's so true about how we make these assumptions, like somebody can just be okay with Thai food or somebody can just be okay with, I'm okay, you know, just like, let it go, you know, but some people feel like they have to keep, you know, asking um, and, and that. So, um, so tell me when, like, what are some of the, what are some of the big challenges other than communication, which was, I think, like you said, I think communication is a pillar. I totally agree with you that. Because it truly does come down to how we, I mean, they yeah. say it's not a cliche. It truly is. How do you communicate with one another? How, because people hear and when they receive, they think they're hearing it a certain way. It's like I had, yeah. had a conversation with somebody. They said, well, that's, that's her thoughts. I go, yeah, but that's her perception. And to her, the perception is real. So, you know, you have to acknowledge that that's, that's what she feels. That's what she sees. And that's what she feels. If you, you may look at it differently. I might look at it differently, but in her world, that's the perception. That's how she feels it was communicated to her. So how do we address that that issue? You know, and I love that you, those are things that you talk about with what you uh, work with your clients. So what would you say the second biggest challenge is outside of communication? There can be many. Um, if um, a one that's been coming up a lot lately um, is, in, uh, is uh, in-laws. Um, family in-laws, um, especially if people are getting married. Um, I work with a lot of premarital, um, couples. Um, but even if people have been married a while, um, the in-laws, it, it, there's a lot of dynamics to it. Um, people can get put in the middle. Um, families, if they're close families originally, like parents and kids, not necessarily always understanding how the priorities for their child need to shift to their new family and family can mean without kids, just a new husband and wife. And that can be a difficult shift. Um, if the parents are not thrilled with the person that was chosen, um, then the, the child can be put in the middle between wanting to protect their, their spouse or partner, but also they love their parents so how to manage that? And I see that I've worked with that many, many times. Um, and it's not easy because there's only so much you can do to help with um, the family. If the family isn't there. If they aren't willing to change, then it's with knowing that realistic expectations of this is what the family is. I first always say, try. And I'll help them with communication with their family that they can go and do. But if that can't change because we can't force people to change, then how do the two partners stay connected, stay on the same team, stay partners with this difficulty? And that comes up. That comes up a lot. And and I could see that because I I mean. You know, I grew up again, my, and it goes back to how my parents met. I, I was like, no wonder why. But my, my grandmother on my dad's side did not like my mom. It was very adamant. And it, 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 it filtered down to us as kids too. You know, it definitely, it definitely filtered down. And, um, and like I said, when I found out years later how my mom and my dad met, I was like, Ma, that explains so much, you know, so, so it totally explains a lot why she felt like she did. 
However, you guys were married, so she needed to get you know past that. But and I, and I was very blessed. I had the best in laws in the world. They were probably nice. the closest thing I ever had as parents uh, to me. You wonderful. Know? Yeah, they both have since passed, but I had the best in laws. And so you, you're right that communication. I remember when I first met my husband. He has an aunt and uncle, uncle, uncle Jim and aunt and Olga. I, and Olga's passed too, but she was like just a sweetheart. But when I met Uncle Jim, he was this big jokester, right? And so I grew up, like I said, you be quiet, you didn't say anything, your elders to talk. And he would always like poke, try to poke the bear at me. And I was like, and Chuck and I would leave. I'm like, if you're never going to talk to your uncle about what he's doing, I'm going to get really upset, right? And he's like, you just have to give it back. He's like, Pearl, he just wants you to give it back. I'm like, okay, fine. So I remember, I'll never ever forget it. it was a Thanksgiving day because we would do Thanksgiving dinner with my husband's side of the family. And then we'd drive up to my mom's in uh, the Banning oh, nice. area of California uh, for dessert. So I remember having Thanksgiving dinner and Uncle Jim, he just like poking the bear. And finally, I just stood up and I was like, I've had enough of you. The way you talk to me, the way you behave. Blah, blah. I don't even know what I said. I'm like, I was talking, go, I'm done for the day. I'm going to the car. Let's go to my mom's now. And I remember Jim comes walking outside. He's like, finally, finally, you start communicating back with me. Finally, you start getting it back to me. I go, you should have done it like this. <laughs> but then we had the best relationship after that, right? Because I learned how to communicate with them. I learned that that's, he likes to joke and that he just yes. tried to get me to joke. And I was a quiet, shy girl who was like, my elders, I don't do that. You know, I didn't grow up that way, right? And it's interesting you were talking about that because I have a friend who, we just had our annual pajama retreat. She made this beautiful cake for us at our retreat. And um, I went to go pick up the cake and she seems stressed. I'm like, and I'm like, what's the matter? She's like, oh my gosh, you know, the wedding, she's getting married next year. Oh. Like, you know, I got to get a dress. And then I'm like, okay, stop, breathe. First of all, breathe. You need to take a deep breath right now. And I, I had a friend in the car. She's like, were you doing a, I go, I had to do a coaching session. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let's talk a minute about that. I said, where are you going to get your dress? And she told me, I go, do not go there. They're going bankruptcy. So do not go there. Oh. Let me give you this person to go to. You don't need that stress, right? And then she's like, and then, you know, the whole bridesmaid thing. She's like, I just started picking my bridesmaid. They're already fighting. I go, you know what? You have a conversation with them that says, this is my wedding. This is how I want to do things. And I can understand and appreciate if it's not, if it's not the right fit for you. So it's okay to tell me that you no longer want to be in the wedding. I said, so open the door. Nice. And letting them know, behave this way. Or leave. It's okay. I, I'm no ill will. And then, then it was funny because my husband has a huge family, probably ten on one side, fifteen on the other side of his mom and dad. And I remember when I met them the first time we went to New York to meet them. I was like, we went through all his dad's side, and we were eating <laughs> Italians. Want to feed you every meal? Family. Yes. Oh my gosh! By the time we got to his, his mom's side, and we went to Aunt Linda's house last. I'm like. If you please tell Linda, I can't eat any more pasta, please. <laughs> and I remember like meeting all of them and being overwhelmed. So she's telling me now, she's like, and he's such from a big family and everybody's in these group text threads. And I don't know. I, she was, I don't know. I go, stop, breathe again. I said, let me tell you what I did. I had a big family of probably 30 people I walked into that we didn't have texting and phones back then. So it was like balance. I said, so gravitate the ones that you can enjoy being around all the time gravitate to the ones that feel like they fill you up and they, you know, they're kind of along the lines of what you, people, your friends you like to hang out here. Just start with a handful. Don't feel like you've got to get to know all of them because you're not going to get to know all of them in one year, in two years, even okay. three years, you know? I said, so gravitate with a small handful that I said, ask your fiance, who do you talk to the most in your cousins? And then start there. I said, don't, nice. don't let the rest of them freak you out. I go, because Trust me, I get where you're coming from. I go, and years later, all those people, you'll have little bits and pieces of them. I said, but don't start out so big. And she's like, I'm so glad you picked up your cake today. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, because you're right, it's the in-laws can be a big, it can be a big thing and it can be a huge, a huge um, impact on a relationship. You know, it's certainly- can. Oh, yes, yeah. very much. And you know, when it's, I believe, you know, if somebody's not close to their family and if they don't see them maybe once a year or talk on the phone once, a, you know, it might be different. But if it's a family that is close um, and everybody's version of close is different. So sees each other fairly frequently. Right. And they're going to be involved. These are people that are going to be in your life. So you are marrying into a family and there's going to be family dynamics. Now, there's also 
what one person, what they grew up with, with the dynamics and how communication went in one family, marrying into another family that's very different, it can be very difficult if it's a family that's really loud, let's say you have a family that's kind of quiet and everybody kind of talks and is, you know, respectful and takes turns and things going. And let's say you're marrying into a family that just, it's not bad. It's not mean. They're loud, right? It's just maybe a loud family and they talk over each other because maybe there's a lot of people and they learned when they were younger, if they weren't loud enough, they wouldn't be heard. But that can be feel almost like they're yelling, they're being right. mean, everybody's upset. And so you can't, as the person going in into a family, you can't change them. Yeah, You are going into their family. So you need to find a way to make it work for yourself, but you can't expect them to completely change. Right. So there's so many different aspects. And because they're around, it is really important to take into consideration. So, um, yeah, there, there is definitely a lot. I will say I highly, highly recommend to everybody pre-engagement or premarital uh, consulting. I do consulting or if it's counseling with somebody, but highly recommend. And it's, it's, it can be just confirmation. There's nothing negative. People tend to think if there's a problem, that's why, but it doesn't have to be. It can just be, okay, let's make sure you've talked about things. And I find a lot of people talk about things, but more in the general. Um, they don't get very detailed. So finances are a big one. Mm -hmm. And it's not just, oh, we're going to just sort of have an accountant. It's, and I'll be like, okay, great. But what are you going to do? Who's paying this bill? Who's paying this bill? When you have money from the wedding, what's happening with the money from the wedding? Right. And I often find that going really detailed is when it doesn't, hasn't been talked about. And so if you have, great. It's a check mark and you go, perfect. Check that off our list. And if everything's been discussed really well, you go, great. You're ready. There's, you're setting yourself up for success. If they haven't been talked about enough or as detailed, great. It gives you an opportunity to talk about it before the wedding, because the truth of the matter is a wedding is a day. It is a day, especially when it's a wedding event. Okay. It is a day. What it is about is a marriage and the marriage is everything after right. we're talking about a day. And a lot of times the focus becomes on the wedding itself and all the planning around the wedding, but not enough people do planning for their marriage. We need to do marriage planning, not just wedding planning. Um, and the other thing with the wedding is this. I feel like there are a couple words missing when people say I do. So when people say I do, they ask you all these questions and you say I do. It's not just I do. It's I do accept, A-C-C-E-P-T, all of you. Yeah. Because if there's something you don't like and you don't bring it up before the wedding and after the wedding, you're like, hey, you do this and this isn't okay. And the person's like, I didn't even know this because we didn't have a chance to talk about it. And maybe it's a big thing, but you... Going into that wedding and, and starting the rest of your life as a married couple needs to be talked about everything. You don't want things to be a surprise later. That's not really fair to the other person. Yeah. So I talk about, I do accept all of you is what that really that. is. I, I love that. That was the one thing I would say that one of the big benefits when we got married in the Catholic church and the Catholic faith, they made you go through what's, what's called engagement encounter. So you could go for a weekend, it could go weekly. And so we chose to go for the weekend. And I will never forget, we're in Southern California. Um, I can't remember the name of the um, mission place where it stayed at. But they separate, you know, the women here, the men here. And then they gave you stuff you had to work on. There was questions, you had to go off and have yeah. one conversation. And we walked out of there. People were leaving, not getting married, which I thought, yeah. so good they had this. But I remember my husband and I, and again, he's just, he's just a great guy. But I remember him, they, you know, they had conversation around finance conversation around kids, you know, all those different things. And I, I always love, I always like to share the story with my son who um, I, I know soon he's probably going to get engaged, but I said, you know, one of the questions came up was how many kids you want to have? Like, you know, not just kids, but how many do you want to have? And jokingly, my yep. husband's like, I think we should have 12. And I looked at him and I said, I'll have three. You can have the rest. We'll make history and make some money. <laughs> I want no more than three. I'm like, and I think that's plenty for us, you know? And then 
you know, it took us a long time. Once we got married, it took us 10 years and we, uh, we were blessed to have our oldest nice. son born of our hearts with through adoption and our youngest son came through in oh. vitro. So, you know, they came very blessed ways, but when we had that, we, we often would refer back to that conversation going, yeah, we thought we we're going to, I said, yeah, you thought we we're going to have 12. We barely had two. <laughs> 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 we miss the book somewhere there, but I, I, you're right. Like the merit, mar- you know, you do the wedding planning, then the the marriage planning, right? I, I know. Um, I had conversations with my son before him, him, his, him and his girlfriend. They graduated from the same college, the same year, and I remember him, you know, saying they were going to move in together, and rightfully so. Her mom was worried about, you know, moving in before marriage, and I'm like, well, rightfully so. You need to have a conversation with them, and you know, offer up conversations. So. And they love my son, Nate. They just love him to death. Nice. He, he, you know, he went out, took the hour and a half drive and, you know, they had the conversation. And Good for and, him. And, and I sat with him and I said, okay, so let me just show you some perspective. Mom, dad, we're going to have different thoughts coming into the conversation. So understand, you know, dad might react one way, but mom's going to react the other way. So you need to understand and be ready for whatever comes, you know, whatever questions. Yeah. Come. And so he's like, he comes home and goes, mom. That wasn't bad at all. I go, well, good. I'm glad it wasn't bad. I go, but at least you went into it prepared going, it could, it could yes. go not so pretty, you know, but I, I mean, I, I tell him all the time, I go, you're blessed to have the same kind of in-laws that I had, you know, and I'm nice. so, so glad that, you know, eventually, I don't know when they're getting engaged, but eventually when they do, it'll be, it'll be a beautiful thing. So I just, I love that you talked about that with the in-law piece and then having, like you said, we, we wedding plan, but we don't marriage plan. And you're right. There's so much afterwards i've had friends go you know afterwards going oh my gosh you know what 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 was that about you know and and i mean my brother you know my brother his first marriage was annulled right away afterwards because Mm -hmm. she you know he had this motorcycle she didn't want him to get rid of the motorcycle there was some other stuff that she knew about but she wouldn't tell her family about my brother and he was very insistent you need to have this conversation and she's like oh well well and then after they got married i was on a cruise ship and um, oh. I had all I had was a pager. I got home from my from my cruise, and my pager was blowing up from my mom. I'm like, "What?" I thought somebody died. And when I called her, she goes, "You guys need to go get your brother." I'm like, "What?" Like I and basically they did the he did the right thing. Let's go talk. They went to talk to the priest, yep. and everything that she would agree to with the priest, she would walk out and say, "I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that." And thankfully, he realized if she can't do this, it's never going to right. So he's like, "Yeah." Okay, let's just stop this now because it's not going to change, you know? And so I told him, I said, I'm proud of you for recognizing it instead of saying, I got to try to make it work and, you know, and settling. I said, you should never settle in a relationship for what you, you know, you want, as long as you guys can communicate it and, and work it out. Great. But if it doesn't, I understand, you know? And so, yeah, that was, that was a crazy time for him. Wow. Yeah. Yes. And we need to, and that's where if somebody says, I'm not going to change, we can't hope that we can change their mind. It Be thankful they're being honest. Actually right. thank them and go, thank you for being honest. Now it might not be what you want to hear and you have to decide if that's a deal breaker, but at least they're being honest with you. And if you don't trust it and you think that you're going to change, if when it doesn't go well, that's on you. It's not on on them. We right. have to really listen. And we're listening not just with our ears, but we're listening by paying attention to actions. Right. Because it's very easy to say something somebody wants, but they will often show you cues in their actions. Right. Yeah. So it's so true. So let's we got we have just a few more. <laughs> I can't believe this has gone by so fast already. Wow. It's flying by. So let me ask you this, Stephanie. One of the things we love to talk about here is self-care. So when you're working with clients, how do you get them to understand th- that individual time? Like when you, you need time for each other. Because I remember my son, my oldest son who passed, he would say to my husband, like when I he, when he got older and realized I was doing things on my own, he's like, dad, why do you let mom go do that on her own? I'm like, oh, well, let me just explain. It's not letting me. Let me just nice. get it straight. Let's have an let's have an educational talk here. Your dad doesn't nice. let you do anything. You know, this is we both have our individual lives, we have our married life, and we have to give each other that space to do things on our own. So talk about that because I know it's interesting too, in watching my son's generation, who was he was 25 when he passed, that there's a lot of that like wanting to control what each other do. and not just men, the boys, but the the girls too, like that. Oh yeah. Kid. So talk about that and how. How do how do you help consult them on allowing time for each other to be with themselves? 
Well, there's a couple things. So there is communication around it. What does it mean? What is the person going to do? If it feels like it's something against the relationship, against the boundaries of what feels safe in the relationship, that's something else. They're going to go spend time with an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend, you know, so there are some conversations about what that looks like. But if it's going to hang out with some friends, it's going to take a class, if it's going, whatever it is, it's talking about um, the why. Why is this important? So this is important because it's healthy. We need to grow as individuals. We are learning, we're growing, we're experiencing. It's good for us as individuals, but it's actually good for the relationship because you also don't want one person growing and not the other. Um, And by growing, you um, are are learning, you're having more experiences, become continuing to stay an interesting person. You're not becoming stagnant. And that you bring back into the relationship and, and it can be exciting. If you do everything together, you also don't have stories or things to share because you already know everything that's going on. So if, you know, if you go out with your friends and your husband goes and goes um, uh, to learn to play guitar, he's going to come back. Oh, my gosh, look what I did. And you do this with your hands. And oh, my gosh, I did this. And this was funny. You're hearing new things. You have more things to talk about. You can talk about your friends. You don't have to talk about everything, but he's also growing. He's having more experiences. He's using his brain in a different way. And this is healthy as individuals, but things that can be healthy as individuals have what I call a side effect. This is a positive side effect of um, helping the relationship grow and growing together. So you're growing as an individual, but you're also staying connected and growing together. So one person doesn't stay stagnant while the other person keeps moving. That can create a whole nother problem. I I love that you work with them on that because it's, it is so important to understand that we have to be our individual selves too. We can't be with each other 24 seven a day because it's, it's not healthy to be able to think we have to, you know, be that way. And, and, you know, I Yeah. And that, I mean, my kids know I, when I finally realized I had to put myself first, I had a conversation with my family and said, I'm going to go for staycations. I might go to the beach here in Clearwater. I might catch a flight to a friend, but I'm going to, it doesn't mean I don't love you guys. It doesn't mean I don't love your dad, but it means I love me enough to say, I have to do this so that I can show up better for you guys. So I'd love to. Absolutely. On that. Yeah. All right. So let me ask you this. So what's your favorite thing you do for self-care? Spend time with my family, including my dog, who is yeah. down here right next to me. What kind of um, dog do you have? I have a uh, four and three quarter pound Maltese, um, white fluff, happy, happy dog. And actually really wonderful because she is so happy and she's adorable and she makes everybody around her happy. And then she's happy with them. And all of that makes me happy. Aww. So it's. It's really this incredible. She's just uh, amazing. And um, I'm also very close with my family. So spending time with them um, really brings me such joy, such happiness. Yay. I love that. Okay. So Stephanie, tell everybody how they can find you and reach out to you. Okay. So um, the best way to reach me is my website. I've got a phone number and an email on there. It is my name, uh, Stephanie, and that's with a PH. Um, and my last name is Mintz with a Z, M-I-N-T-Z dot com. So Stephanie Mintz dot com. And you can reach out if you have questions about this. You can let me know that you heard me here and I'd be happy to see how I can best help you. Amazing. And we will put that in the show notes for anybody who's driving and can't take that notes down. Yeah. I'll in the show notes. They can get that for you as well. And I, I forewarned Stephanie before we got on about our cards. So I'm going to shuffle our, our better questions, better life cards. And if you're the first time listening, these are cards developed by a friend of mine and her friend. I get no kickback, but go to betterquestionsbetterlife.com. There are over 70 cards of asking questions that help you meditate, journal, or just be thought provoking for you. So I'm going to shuffle and Stephanie, you tell me when to stop. So here we go. Stop. Oh, we did early in the car. Oh, your question says, am I stretching myself? Ooh, there can be so many different ways that can be. Um, Probably not stretching physically enough. That one, I will say. Um, Stretching myself. I am. I am constantly stretching my brain. Um, I hear new scenarios. I am constantly coming up with new strategies. Um, 
I am um, always trying to find the best ways to help my my clients. I think about them throughout the week. I also have, they have access to me during the week, but I am thinking about what else I can be doing to help them even, even more. So yes, my, my brain stretches a lot. It's actually harder for it not to be stretching than it is to be stretching. That's amazing. <laughs> and always thinking of ways you can do something better is a great way to use our mind. So thank yes. you so much for joining us today. It's been so, so much fun. And I can't wait to share the episode with everybody. And I want to remind everybody, if you're listening, you know that we just came off of our seventh annual pajama retreat. And we've already announced next year's retreat is September 12th through the 16th in the Gulf Shores of Alabama. We're going back there. That's be become our jam of a space to have our retreats. So if you want more information, we are halfway full. So I mean, we just got off the retreat. So look out. Nice. So, yeah, it's amazing. So if you want to learn more, just go to WSLivingRetreats.com. That's WSLivingRetreats with an S.com. And you can get your, you can get a pay in full or you can take up to one year to pay off the retreat. So just want to remind everybody of that. And also leave you with this. You come into this world. You are this amazing oyster. You're a little rough on the outside, but on the inside, mm -hmm. as you open up and you start shining on yourself, you find your inner pearl to greatness. And I hope you go out today and continue to shine that inner pearl. Have a great day. Sunshine, good to see you again. Had to walk out to let you back in. Stuck in a storm.